Hello and welcome to Fireline Safety Refresher Training. This video will ask you to dust off some risk management tools such as the 10 fire orders, LCES, and the 18 watch out situations and use them in some real life fire scenarios from the 2001 fire season. Hopefully this will jog your memory and provide you with some mental triggers that will help you recognize and mitigate safety hazards you may encounter this year. But before we get started, I want to share with you some startling statistics about our fire community. These stats are also outlined in your student workbook. At the time of this taping, there have been 809 reported deaths in wildland fire operations, 18 of which occurred in the 2001 fire season. Between 1976 and 1999, we averaged 70 entrapments and 43 shelter deployments per year. I don't know about you, but that sounds awfully high to me. And I have to ask, what have we learned from these events that can help us lower these numbers in the future? In 1994, 34 people were killed in wildland fire operations, many of whom were our highly trained Type 1 firefighters. After that season, the fire community vowed to learn from those tragic deaths. We vowed to strengthen our training curriculum, stiffen our qualification requirements, and provide some standards for fire operations that would hold people accountable for maintaining firefighter safety. Safety first, six minutes for safety, safety gram, safe net, Safety's been drilled into our heads at every level. Tragically, since 1994, 108 more people have been killed in wildland fire operations. What is it about there's nothing out there worth a human life that we don't seem to understand? There must be something out there worth a human life because we continue to see between 10 and 20 fatalities a year. Why are we, here today, not among the 108 people who have given their lives since 1994? What are we doing right that they were doing wrong? Do we train differently? Or is it just a matter of luck that we're still here? What are we doing to keep ourselves safe? What performance standard do you personally hold yourself accountable to? Do you consider yourself a professional firefighter or is this just a, you know, a fun summer job? Are we just here for the money or do we consider ourselves students of fire? How seriously do you take this job? Because the truth is, fire doesn't care how old you are, what type of resource you are, how big your organization is, what position you hold, what training you've had, or even how much experience you've had. Given a certain set of circumstances, which usually involves some element of human error, fire can result in your death. We at the BLM Training Unit urge you to take this training seriously. Participate in the exercises with a desire to learn something new and share something new with someone sitting next to you. Get the most out of the collective experience in your training groups. There's always something new to learn about fire. Try to advance your level of knowledge to the next level, whatever that level is for you. Actively seek out new information and use it this year on the fire line. Good luck with this course and with the coming fire season. It's a serious job and, you know, the attitude of your crew is going to affect, you know, the attitude of your performance. And if your crew is professional and, and does your does the job correctly, and and at the end of the shift when you're back at fire camp, you can joke and laugh all you want. But the time you're spent out on the line, there should be a definite game face and serious attitude out there. You have all winter to joke around. This. You know, your life insurance policy out on the line is your uh, 10 and 18, your, your fire orders and your 18 watch out situations. As you all know, there is a huge bundle of reference material available for you to use when making decisions regarding fire. In this course, we will focus on the Interagency Incident Response Pocket Guide, or the Yellow Book as many people call it. Uh, we talked to Paul Hefner, who was one of the originators of this book. Paul started his career back in 1966. He's a Type 1 Incident Commander and is currently a Fire Staff Officer on the Payette National Forest in Idaho. I want to share with you his thoughts on this reference. Several years back, uh, there were several of us here at the Fire Center that uh, uh, had recently come from the field. And uh, we were noticing uh, a, lot of, a lot of development with pocket cards uh, wallet cards, uh, different publications, that in some cases they all said the same thing. Uh, in other areas we saw different uh, regions of the Forest Service and units of, uh, of BLM uh, publishing this initial response pocket guide. They were doing it individually 
and uh, every one of them was just a little different from the other. And, and as we all know, every firefighter fights fire in different areas, and, and to have that inconsistency around the country wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't necessarily the best uh, situation. Well, our initial thought was that uh, the Fireline ha Handbook addresses quite well uh, dealing with, with, with management situations, with position descriptions, uh, checklists in, in overhead positions, uh, and some ICS typing and, and some of those standards within the incident command system. It doesn't really hit very closely the, the tools that are needed for, for the on-the-ground firefighter. So our initial hit was to not uh, duplicate the Fireline Handbook, although there are a few things that are in the Fireline Handbook that are also in the, the pocket guide. But this idea was to have it as a pocket guide for, for the on-ground firefighter. The Fireline Handbook could potentially be in a pack or in a briefcase for the individuals that supervise the on-the-ground firefighters. Uh, it may be one or two levels up. And then any other operational guides, example of the uh, Standards for Fire and Aviation Operations, that would be the book that would probably be in the vehicle, uh, in the briefcase, on the FMO's desk, and on the line officer or agency administrator's uh, desk as, as a guide, as a reference to, to what are the standards for fire operations. So there basically would be a three-phase, three-level uh, 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 reference. The green pages of the initial response pocket guide are, are operational pages. And we put those at the front of the book because they're so important in the way we do business. They need to be looked at weekly, daily, during your six-minute uh, for safety. Uh, they involve risk management. They involve tactical watchouts, many different checklists, uh, things that uh, you may encounter every day, but things that you may encounter only in a rare event. It's so important that you put so much emphasis, you put a, a great level of emphasis on, on knowing what's in the green pages, and you practice these things that are in the green pages. If we teach the book, the book is included through our, all our refreshers, uh, our rookie schools, um, all those areas that we teach our firefighters or we refresh our firefighters, if all the elements of the book are taught during that, I think the people will start to come around more and be able to use it as a tool instead of just handing it off to them. Uh, a seasoned firefighter will see the tools in the box and say, yeah, these are things that I can use. Well, this is great. This is great. The beginning firefighter may not know a lot of the applicability because they've never been in these situations before. So I th it, again, it's so important that we teach the book, we make it a standard, that this is part of your everyday life. This is no different than that driver's license that you have in your pocket that you have to take a test on every so many years. Uh, it, it, will, it will greatly, greatly increase the, the way we all consistently fight fire, whether it's a person from Alabama come to the West or we go to Alabama and help them fight fire. If we're all doing it the same way, we can, we can, I think we can be a lot safer and more efficient. The other thing is that, that uh, um, terminology, uh, this also helps uh, uh, clean up some of our terminology, uh, many different ways of saying the same thing. All these checklists have st standard terminology, PMS, uh, uh, NWCG approved terminology. Uh, if we're all using this as a teaching tool and then as an application tool, I think we, we uh, better understanding from each other uh, as we come from all different parts of the country together to fight fire. To help you get acquainted with this book, we'll ask you to use it while working through some exercises. You can use other references also if you like, but I think you'll find this book very helpful. It was designed to be used on the ground by working firefighters. So to get us started, let's put on our fire hats and go look at the Fridley fire that burned part of Montana this last season. Welcome to the Fridley Fire, and it's September 1st in Bo just outside of Bozeman, Montana. The Fridley Fire is approximately 24,000 acres, and it started about a week ago after a lightning storm. The fire uh, exploded to uh, about 15,000 acres in one day after a major wind event. Afterwards, the, the uh, sporad sporadic winds from all different directions have pretty much made the fire edge fan out in all directions. As a division soup, I came in and there was a major edge of fire 
uh, along the division that I have, this division Lima, and the D division Lima is approximately five miles long. The, the main edge of the fire uh, came up from the, uh, from, from the north and it was a wind-driven fire causing uh, spot fires up to half a mile in front of the head of the fire. Uh, the fuel type is primarily subalpine fir and it's very patchy. Uh, areas where the subalpine fir uh, was contiguous pretty much uh, maintained a crown fire during the whole event. Uh, as the uh, fire hit the edges and came down slope, it hit into patchier fuels and it caused spot fires throughout the whole area. Off to the east, uh, the fire has burned all through this area, leaving islands of unburned fuels uh, and also uh, spot fires throughout the whole edge, which we're trying to deal with now. Uh, spot fires are throughout the whole area and if you notice uh, the grasses in this area, the meadows, have not burned. Also, if it was in a draw, most of the draws have not burned. But the fire is, is carrying uh, underneath and every once in a while will hit uh, areas of subalpine fir. It'll torch and the gusty erratic winds we've been having the last week send spot fires all over. We have two strike teams of engines, uh, which are primarily Type 6s. We have two water tenders, which are 5,000 gallons, a D6 dozer. We also have uh, an, an item called the Proteus, which carries 3,000 gallons, and it's like a skitter. Uh, it, it can also shear and knock over trees as part of, uh, of its uh, capabilities. And we have two skidgens which are skidders of different sizes, which can carry uh, uh, up to three to, to uh, 1,500 gallons of water, and six hand crews. Uh, the weather forecast was for hotter and drier. It's been in the 80s, and it's gonna be in the high 80s today, uh, which is, uh, causes it to really heat up during the day. We also have uh, relative humidities dropping down uh, to the mid-teens, between 15 to 17 percent is expected today. Our trigger point where we start seeing uh, torching with the subalpine fir is right around 20 percent. Also uh, with winds, which is a critical element in the torching too, that we found, uh, especially if it's going to carry um, in the canopy, is around uh, 15 to 20 mile an hour winds. And today's forecast was uh, for winds and generally between 10 to 15 miles an hour, but we're having gusts up to 25 miles an hour, which is really causing uh, sporadic torching throughout the division.